Hello magpies, and welcome to the final part of this series, wherein I furnish you with narrative overviews and rules for tying your D&D character's background to one of over 40 different cultural identities of Faerun. Framed within the context of my own variant on the Forgotten Realms, but also applicable to the core setting as well. In my world, the era of high fantasy is ending, and it is the dawn of the Age of Man, an historical analogue reflecting many themes of the mid to late medieval period. The elves have mostly retreated from the world. The gods no longer speak to their followers, except through intermediaries. And new national and cultural identities are being formed in the wake of a divine spell plague that stripped the earth of healing magic, resulting in half of the population of Faerun perishing to disease, war, and to social decay. Now a new day dawns, but the memories of that dark age still live on especially among the longer-lived races of Toral, who cannot soon forget. While humanity's star rises, as human perseverance and adaptability shows a near-infinite capacity for new generations to define the world in their own image, most non-human races rise beside them, forging new identities in relation to this new age of technology, revolution, and faith. But there are those who, whether through trauma, xenophobia, obstinacy, or material utility, look inwards, rejecting the multicultural human empires to find meaning among their own people, their own traditions, and their own histories. These non-human enclaves present an opportunity for players to tell stories of exploration, of personal growth, and of culture clash, as their characters' insular upbringings are inevitably challenged by the widening of their own social in-groups through travel and through adventure. It also presents an opportunity for the telling of salient narratives that, handled sensitively and maturely, present an analogue to the dilemmas of our own world, being dichotomously grappled between tribalism and the imperative for global answers to the endemic and mortal threats to all people, regardless of their race, nation, class, or creed. So, how does it work? Well, following the same rules that I laid out in part one of this series for tying your backstory to a specific culture or a national identity, you may choose for your character to be a fairly typical member of a certain racial group, raised among their own with fairly minimal experience outside of their own people. This presents a certain challenge, as my world has no common tongue and therefore I strongly advise you to find a way within the character creation to take the language most commonly spoken where the adventure occurs. Else you may not even be able to communicate with your own party. So let us begin first with the dwarves and their three subraces. Known either as the Shield Dwarves or the Mountain Dwarves, these are the classic stout folk of Western fantasy. When the Divine Spell Plague began, 
They sealed up their mountain fortress cities and retreated underground to wait out the end of the world. Over the next 80 years, their fortunes stagnated and in isolation, their culture became all pervasive and in some cases escalating into exaggerated caricatures of themselves. Think of shield dwarf cities as intensely conservative and hegemonic enclaves where distrust of the outside world is fed by trauma, stubbornness and rooted in deep tradition. Yet each outpost in isolation and left to their own devices has developed a unique variation upon this theme. Some fell to madness and to paranoia, turning to the infernal, embracing warlock patrons. And a few even came to believe that any evidence of the world outside of their mountain tops were illusions wrought by demons that wished to tear their people, being the last survivors of the apocalypse, apart. Others gradually reinforce social roles, escalating wealth disparities while allowing their own common folk to be preyed upon by hopelessness and addiction, while still others flourished through underground wealth, new technology, or alliances with monsters unearthed in their eternal excavations. Found across the length and the breadth of the world, each mountain dwarf stronghold presents an opportunity for the wild, the fanciful, or the dark parody on a theme. Critiques of capitalism and patriarchy, cultural analogues, tribalism and grudges, or post-apocalyptic heavy metal manticore riding berserkers are all tales that can be told of those shield brothers who dug down too deep. Today, driven by malnutrition, social unrest, exile, or the, simply the need for new farmland to feed their growing population. Select mountain strongholds open their gates, and the dwarves re-enter the grand geopolitic once again. Inhabitants of mountain dwarf enclaves speak dwarven as their common tongue, and they may take either a warhammer or a battle axe as their regional equipment, for skill at arms is taught to all. But for those of a particularly wealthy or militaristic bent, they may take a set of breastplate armor and a potion of healing. Known as gold dwarves or hill dwarves, these dark-skinned, taller dwarves maintain a mighty empire in the Great Rift of the Eastern Shah, as well as a few select steppes and foothill communities, escaping the paranoia and the regression of their mountain cousins. Their paths were no easier to walk though, as the destruction of the Underdark wrought havoc upon the lower levels of their empire in the Great Rift, and has driven them to become increasingly militaristic, as abominations crawl up from those benighted depths. Ruled by clan elders called the Deep Lords, they also face the ongoing threat of Mulhorandi expansion into the Shah. Into the Shah. Despite their willingness to trade with outsiders, Gold Dwarves are deeply conservative in their views and traditions. 
finding self-worth in wealth and in the reputations of their families. Inhabitants of the Great Rift and other Gold Dwarf enclaves, uh, they speak Dwarvish as their common tongue, and they may take a scroll of Bull's Strength and Five Thunderstones if they come from familial lines of merchants, deep miners, or they are runesmiths being their term for magic users. Or they may take a battle axe if they were trained to give their lives in war. Or finally, they may take scale mail armor and a shield if they ranked among those sworn to guard their fortresses and the tombs of their ancestors. Grey Dwarves or Dugar were once slaves to mind flayers, but they won their freedom and make their living crafting magical armaments, as well as preying upon isolated mountain dwarf strongholds with a steady supply of contraband. Living near volcanoes or in pitch darkness as befits their brutalist philosophies, Jugar consider their own lack of happiness to be their greatest strength. The inhabitants of Jugar enclaves speak both Dwarven and Undercommon as their common tongues, and they may take either a chain shirt, a battle axe, or a hand axe, usually crafted by themselves in the endless toil of their dreary existence. The Dwarven religions follow a pantheon known as Mondensamen, meaning Shield Brothers on High or High Dwarves. It consists of Moradin, who leads the pantheon, as well as Abathor, Berenar, True Silver, Clangeddon Silverbeard, Dugmarin Brightmantle, Dumathuin, Gorm Gulthin, Hala Brightax, Ladagua, Martha Mordwin, Sharindla, and Vergadain. It also features Deep Duera, the god of the Dugar, and Thadha, who is worshipped by the strange jungle dwarves of Chult. Next, we find the gnomes. Forest gnomes have no category here, you may note, as they are societies indeed. They are too decentralized and free living to develop strict racial enclaves. And even though many forest gnomes are entirely alien to human society or any society for that matter, Likewise, inhabitants of Lantern, the gnomish homeland, they use the entry for Lantern explored in part 6 of this series, leaving behind only two subraces to detail. Outside of Lantern, gnomish communities are rare and tend to adapt to human society and fit in. Indeed, rock gnomes are among the most heavily represented non-humans in human society, as they often find themselves well suited to administrative, organizational, and academic pursuits, as well as fueling the technology boom on the Dragon Coast, as well as they are found within the secular thaumaturgist cult of the Sunset Vale. But despite their, in some ways, advantageous place in society, the myth of the model minority is just that. A myth, and a minority nonetheless. The world is violent, sometimes overbearing, and it is within us all, big and small alike, 
to want a place of our own, suited to our own needs and stature. Therefore, beneath hills, in woodlands, and down long country lanes, an astute traveller will find enclaves of rock gnomes who prefer the pastoral ideal to the stereotype of the urban scholar that follows their people. Inhabitants of such rock gnome enclaves speak gnomish as their common tongue. And the most well-connected inhabitants of these communities wield weapons imported from Lantern, and may take a gunpowder pistol, a powder horn, and bullets. Or, among those who keep the peace, or who seek adventure, they may take studded leather armor and three tanglefoot bags. While those of quiet or studious pursuits may take scrolls of invisibility and of silent image. Also known as the Svafniblen, deep gnomes are overly serious folk who live deep underground. Though they are very kind to their own, they are just as suspicious of outsiders as they are single-minded in their chosen professions. Despite their bad reputation and cynical attitudes, deep gnomes live in very close-knit communities, hidden away from the world in underground caverns. Members of Svafniblen enclave speak both gnomish and undercommon as their common tongues. While those who seek glittering wealth in the mines may take a dagger and either a light hammer or a war pick, while those who defend their communities may take a chain shirt. The gnomish religions follow a pantheon known as the Lords of the Golden Hills, which is led by Garl Glittergold, and it also includes Baravar Cloakshadow, Flandal Steelskin, Gerdal Iron Hand, and Sagojan Earthcaller. Plus Beorvan Wild Wanderer, the patron of forest gnomes, Kaladuran Smooth Hands, the god of the deep gnomes, and Erdlan. Interestingly, Erdlan is not actually worshipped by gnomes, but rather by gnome like creatures called Spriggans, who rank among the most evil creatures to ever darken Faerun with their presence. Nonetheless, Erdlan remains a part of the gnomish pantheon as a kind of a scary story to frighten children and adults both. Now we move on to halflings, a people whose true name is the Hin. In fact, unbeknownst to most who use the term so thoughtlessly, halfling is in fact a racial slur, albeit one almost never used cruelly and one that is so ingrained in usage that only generational change could ever really see its abandonment. Indeed, few Hin outside of bold and self-assured strong hearts will ever really object to the use of the word halfling. Although this does not change the fact that Hin are not half of anything. They are a whole people. But away from big folk, they may very well jokingly refer to outsiders as doublelings. Strongheart halflings or strongheart hin communities, they use the entry for Luren, covered in part six of the series. And stronghearts, they present an opportunity for players to avoid the darker lore of their Lightfoot cousins for a more classical hin experience. 
This leaves two sub-races remaining on the table. While the rare are strong hearts, they stayed safe and secure in their distant homeland of Luren. When society began to fall apart in the Spell Plague, Lightfoots, they found themselves weaker, more vulnerable to ostracization and less useful to lords in high castles than, say, gnomes were. Thus, the Hin suffered terribly at the outskirts of society and continue to feel the generational trauma of that time to this day. Therefore, the formation of Hin communities in ghettos, in small farming villages, or in the shadow of city walls is relatively commonplace. Within, distrust of outsiders is a part of life, but Lightfoots have learned to mask their resentment and to play to the stereotype of jolly halflings. Beneath the surface, however, they have developed a complex system of banking and money transference where a hin may take a letter of credit to claim wealth in any halfling community. And they may hold, uh, and the hin hold beside this many other secrets. The details of which I save for a future reveal. Regardless, one rule is sacrosanct among the Lightfoot Hin. To keep the secrets of the Hin. And this includes not teaching their language to outsiders. The punishment for breaking this social contract is severe, both for the outsider and for the loose-lipped Lightfoot who let it slip. Regardless though, a passing adventurer stopping for an ale at any number of bright, pastoral, countryside halfling villages would never guess at the depths of their secrecy. In the metropolitan cities, however, it becomes a little bit more evident, as the ghettos into which the Hin were once pushed continue to grow rapidly through the injection of wealth that enters but never seems to leave their tight-knit suburbs, leading to the increased othering of Hin by adjacent agents who would kill to learn the secrets of halfling wealth accumulation. Members of a Lightfoot community, they speak as their common tongue, both Hin being the halfling language and the dominant language of their region. They may also take their choice of ranged weapons, being either a light crossbow and bolts, a sling and bullets, or a short bow and arrows. Or, if they would just prefer to avoid the fight altogether, they may take a Qual's feather token of a bird. While to the point of seeming almost feral to outsiders, Ghostwise Hin exhibit psychic powers and inhabit deep forests, such as the Chondlewood, the methwood between Chacenta and Antha, and the forests of Amtar, south of the Shah. They almost never leave their dark forests and are deeply hostile to outsiders. The members of a ghostwise tribe, they speak Hin as their common tongue. And those who hunt beasts of the woods may take either a short bow and arrows or a spear. While those who 
make potions and mind-altering ritual concoctions. They may take three doses of blue Winus potion, which is a Winus poison rather, which is a poison applied on injury that has a constitution save DC 10, or else fall unconscious with wild dreams for 60-10 minutes. While finally, those that tend to the giant spiders they farm may take two doses of a particularly virulent giant spider poison, which is a poison applied by injury that deals 2d6 poison damage with half damage on a successful DC 11 constitution saving throw. The religions of the Hin are drawn from a pantheon known as Yondala's children. It is ruled by Yondala and includes Avarin, Brandabaris, Siralali, Sheila Perrol, and Urugalan. Now we turn to the oft maligned children of Grumsh. Both orcs and half orcs form their own tribes and civilizations and confederacies across Faerun, which vary from the savagely warlike to the noble and civilized. While half-orc communities are less common, they are better adjusted to cohabitation with and within human society. Such enclaves are to be found anywhere and everywhere, except in Cormia, where the dark memories of the Goblin Wars and the fall of Arabel to Orcish forces run deep. Members of an Orcish or Half-Orc community speak Orcish as their common tongue, while Half-Orc communities also receive the dominant human language of their, re of their region. They may take a potion of enhance ability, ball strength, and a potion of greater healing if they work as or assist their traditional human sh traditional shamans, traditional orcish shamans, or if they prefer a more traditional role of fighting on the front line and of taking blows that would cripple weaker beings. They may take banded mail with armor spikes, which deal 1d4 piercing damage to enemies making grappling checks against them, and which also increases their unarmed strike damage to 1d4 piercing damage. Or if they would just prefer the life of a raider, or to honor their ancestors with displays of martial prowess, they may take either a great axe or a flail. The Orcish religions derive from a pantheon known as the tribe of he who watches. It is led by Grumsh and includes also Bagthru, Ilnaval, Luthic, Shargas, and Yertrus. Finally, we reach the one people who collectively hold more secrets and are shout shrouded in more mystery than all of the Hin combined. I am referring, of course, to the various elvish subraces. And while I shall cover elvish lore more thoroughly in a future video, I shall outline their silhouettes at least, while at the same time deliberately leaving swathes of their society vague and ill-defined. For indeed, not all secrets are best known at character creation, but half of the joy is in the discovery. So first we encounter the mortal threat to human civilization. Being the last true elves known to exist in the mortal plane. 
The conquering armies of the Drow are a mystery to the inhabitants of Faerun. The Drow seem to loathe the worship of the gods, but still seem to preserve parts of their own pantheon despite the death of Lolth. It is unclear the status of the female Drow ruling class that once led their subterranean society, as only males have been spotted on the battlefield in these early stages of the war. Only half drow fleeing persecution can spread insight into the churning wheels of death and madness that are the drow war machine that drives creatures from the underdark through eternal twilight, through towards ripe human lands. The challenges to a player wanting to play a drow, a creature known for intolerable cruelty who seems to threaten all life, this is not a challenge to be understated. If a drow character is not killed on sight, they are likely to be brought in for interrogation as a presumed spy. Even half drow who have every reason to flee discrimination for their impure blood will find no safety in human lands, except in rare cases where they may prolong their usefulness to the war effort or to other agendas. Those rare escapees of Dro society, however, though they are tight-lipped about their experiences, they do tend to be highly skilled linguists, speaking as their common tongues, both elvish, undercommon, and a form of sign language used by Dro on to communicate silently on the battlefield. They may take a hand crossbow with bolts, being the chosen weapon of their people, while assassins and berserkers may take a short sword and a dagger. And finally, spellcasters may take a scroll of enhance ability, Cat's Grace, and a scroll of web. The Drow religion is based on a pantheon known as the Dark Seldarine, formerly ruled by Lolth. And as far as mortals can know anything about the status of gods, it is generally understood that both Lolth and Kiran Sali perished before the divine spell plague even began. Nonetheless, followers of Selvatarm have been observed on the battlefield, and followers of Varon are known to be involved in espionage against the Raven Banner. Which begs the question of the status of the cult of Gonador, who is, it is imagined, works silently behind the scenes to furnish the armies with the armaments of war if indeed their cult still exists and supports the war at all. As far as goes for the rest of the elven subraces, there are presently no known established elvish enclaves left in Faerun, although some fallen elves are determined to rebuild them. However, these emergent social ingroups have no real wealth of tradition to draw upon other than what they read about in books, so they fall largely short. Such an elven society would require additional world building beyond what is presented here, or the release of future secrets as of yet unspoken. Nonetheless, I provide some skeleton rules for elven enclaves here to facilitate that eventuality. Note that this is not a complete list of all elven subraces, but merely those best known across Faeron 
and those therefore in theory most likely to be emulated or most likely to have survived the retreat. Also known as Sun Elves, the High Elves, they are the most common and famous elves throughout Faerun. Inhabitants of Sun Elf communities, they speak Elvish as their common tongue. And those who rise to the defense of their homelands, they may take one of the traditional weapons of their armies, either a longsword, a lance, or a longbow and arrows. While those who keep the ancient law of their people may take a scroll of invisibility and a scroll of levitate. And finally, those who practice the old magic may take a wand of color spray. Also known as moon elves, the pallid elves are paler than their bright cousins and maintain a close relationship with the moon. Inhabitants of moon elf communities speak elvish as their common tongue. And those who seek adventure, they may take either a longsword, a rapier, or a longbow with arrows. Or those who guard against dangers in the night may take a suit of breastplate armor. While well, finally, those who tend to the moonlit groves may take a scroll of bark skin and a scroll of cure wounds. The wood elves represent those who abandon civilization to live closer to nature. These elves favor archery above all other martial skills, so in addition to speaking elvish as their common tongue, they may take either a mighty short bow and arrows or a mighty long bow and arrows, with the mighty special rule allowing them to use strength instead of dexterity if they wish, like a reverse finesse. Alternatively, they may take studded leather armor and a potion of pass without trace if they prefer a more subtle approach. And finally, there are tales of wild elves who refused to heed the call to retreat and thus disappeared into the deepest wilds, never to be seen again. Surely such elves would either be driven so wild with madness that they would be unrecognizable among their kin or else so well hidden that one would never find them in a lifetime of looking. If indeed these legends were true inhabitants of such communities, in addition to speaking Elvish as their common tongue, would take either a spear or a longbow and arrows to satisfy their penchant for hunting and for war. Or they might take studded leather armor to defend against the many dangers of the wilds. Or finally, those with cause to travel to places where they might be noticed by an outsider would well choose to take hide armor and a potion of pass without trace. The elvish religions are derived from a pantheon known as the Seldarene. It is ruled by Corallon Lorethian beside Angarad, who is the combined form of the goddesses Eadri Feanya, Hanali Selenil, and Sehenin Moonbow. The pantheon also features Erevan Ilasare, Fenmarl Mestarin, Labalas Enareth, Rilafane Ralathil, Shevaresh, Solonor Thalandira, and finally, Deep Sashalas, the patron, the patron of aquatic elves. Thank you, magpies, and I mean it, truly, from the bottom of my heart. You have now graduated 
from the languages, cultures and societies of Faerun 101. I appreciate you sticking with my ponderous style more than I can say. And now? Well, I suppose now I should move on to another element of character creation and lore in the realm of heterodoxy. Races? Classes? Faiths? Hmm. I haven't decided yet. But if you will pardon the shamelessness and indulge me a moment, if you have enjoyed this, hitting the like button or leaving a nice comment, it helps me to find the wherewithal to create content for you immeasurably. I have so many more projects lined up that I cannot wait to share with you all. I love you all so very much. And now, now, well, there's nothing more to say except swoop swoop. <laughs>